operations is the load and store are registered to register operations and they are typically relatively large number of general purpose registers that is maintained in what we call the register window. The number of machine instructions, instruction formats, addressing modes are relatively small compared to CISC architecture. OK, so we will see this risk architecture in the context of spark patients. These are um, uh, from Sun Corporation. OK, so the ultra spark processor announced by Sun Microsystems in 1995 is the latest member of spark family. Other members of this family include a variety of spark super spark processors. The original Spark architecture was developed in mid 80s and have been implemented by a number of manufacturers. The name Spark stands for Scalable Processor Architecture. OK, the architecture is intended to be suitable for a wide range of implementations from microcomputers to supercomputers. Although Spark, Super Spark and Ultra Spark architectures differ slightly, they are upward compatible and share the basic structure. This section contains an overview of the ultra spark architecture and which will serve the background for the examples for the discussion later in the which will continue. OK, so. So memory memory consists of 8 bit bytes. All addresses are byte addresses. OK. Two consecutive bytes form a half word. Four words form a word length. 8 bytes form a double word. Half words are stored in memory beginning at byte addresses that are multiples of 2. OK, similarly words begin at addresses that are multiples of 4 and double words at addresses multiples of 8. Ultra Spark program can be written using a virtual address space of 2 to the power 64 bytes. The address space is divided into pages. The multiple pages are supported. Some pages used by a program may be in physical memory, while others may be stored on disk. When an instruction, so um, uh, is executed, the hardware of the operating system makes sure that the needed page is loaded into the physical memory. The virtual address is specified by the instruction, automatically is translated to physical address by the ultra spark memory management unit. OK, so the spark architecture includes a register file. OK, that usually contains more than 100 general purpose registers. The exact number varies from one implementation to another. However, any procedure can access only 32 registers designated R0 through R31. The first eight of these registers R0 through R7 are global. That is, they can be accessed by all procedures on the system. Register R0 always contains the value 0. OK, and the 24 registers are available to a procedure and can be visualized as a window, register window, through which part of the register file can be seen. These windows overlap, so some of the registers in the register file are shared between the procedures. So this helps in parameter passing, you know, which are through shared registers. For example, R8 through R15 of a calling procedure are physically same registers R24 to R31 of the called procedure. This facilitates, facilitates the passing of parameters. The Spark hardware manages the windows into a register file. If a set of concurrently running procedures needs more windows than are physically available, window overflow interrupt occurs. The operating system must save the content of some of the registers in file and restore them later to provide additional windows that are needed. In original Spark architecture, general purpose registers were 32 bits long. Later implementation in Ultra Spark expanded these registers to 64 bits. The Spark implementation provides several physically different sets of global registers for use of application procedures and by variables and by and by various hardwares and operating system functions. OK. So uh, now floating point computations are performed using floating point unit FPU on ultra spark. These units 
contains a file of 64 double precision floating point registers and several other control and status registers. Besides these register files, there are there is a pro, there are program counter which contains address of the next instruction to be executed, condition code registers, and a number of control registers. Okay. Data formats. The AltaSpark architecture provides storage of integers and floating point values, characters, integers stored at 8, 16, 32, 60, 64 bit binary numbers. Both signed and unsigned integers, two's complement is used to store negative values. In, gen, in original Spark architecture, the most significant part of the numerical value is stored in lowest numbered address. Okay. This is commonly known as the big endian byte ordering. In CISC, it is the other way. It's known as little endian byte ordering. So big end of the values comes first in the memory. UltraSpark supports both big endian and little endian byte orderings. There are uh, three different floating point data formats. The single precision format is 32 bit long. OK, it stores 23 bits of the floating point value and allows 8-bit exponent. So this 23-bit is the mantissa part and 8-bit is the exponent part. Remaining bits used to store the sign of the floating point value. The double precision format is 64-bit long. It, it stores 52 bits in the mantissa part and 11-bit in the exponent part. The quad precision format stores 63 significant bits that allows 15-bit exponent. Characters are stored one per byte using 8-bit ASCII code. Okay. So instruction formats. There are three basic instruction formats in Spark architecture. All of the formats are 32-bit long. The first two bits of the instruction word specify which format is being used. Format. So there are uh, um, so there are three formats. So format one is used. So since there are three formats, two bits are required. So that is determined by the first two bits. OK, format one is used uh, for the call instruction. Format two is used for the branch instruction. One special instruction that enters a value into a register. The remaining instructions use format three, which provides for register load and stores, three operand arithmetic operations and so on. The fixed instruction length in Spark architecture is a typical risk system and is intended to speed the process of instruction fetching and decoding, okay, and also applying pipelining, okay, concept. Compare the approach with the complex variable instruction found in CISC systems, okay, so such as VAX and uh, uh, Intel uh, processors, okay. So as in um, uh, most architectures, operand value may be specified as a part of the instruction it itself, in case of immediate addressing, or it may be register direct, okay, mode. So operands in memory are addressed using one of the following three modes: PC relative, okay, program counter relative, where the target address is called com computed by adding the content of the program counter with the displacement, which is 30 bit signed. Register indirect with displacement, okay which is uh, uh, here the target address is computed by the uh, content of the specified register with the displacement field that is 13 bit signed and register indirect indexed a register indirect indexed in which the target address is computed adding the contents of the two specified registers okay pc relative mode is used only for branch instructions and the relatively few addressing modes of Spark allow for more efficient implementations than 10 or more found modes found in the six and the Intel um, processors. OK, so the sp big Spark, uh, the, the basic Spark architecture, OK, has fewer than 100 machine instructions reflecting reflecting risk philosophy. Compare it with 300 to 400 instructions often found in CISC systems. The only instruction that access memory are loads and stores. All other instructions are registered to register operations. Instruction execution on a Spark is pipelined. While one instruction is being executed, the next one is being fetched from memory and decoded. Okay, but in case of branch, you have to take care of a little bit um, 
because pipeline hazards may come. In most cases, the technique speeds instruction execution. However, an ordinary branch instruction might uh, cause the process to stall. The instruction following the branch, which had already been fetched and decoded, would have to be discarded, okay, without being executed. So you have to flush the pipeline. So to make the pipeline work more efficiently, spark uh, branch instructions, including subroutine calls, are delayed branches. This means that the instruction immediately following the branch instruction is, is actually executed before the branch is taken. For example, the instruction sequence sub this L percent L0, 11 percent L1, B A next branch to next and move percent L1 uh, percent O3. The move instruction is executed before the B A instruction, that is the branch instruction. The move instruction is said to be in the delay slot of the branch. OK, the programmer must take these characteristics into account when writing the assembly language program. So further um, discussions you can uh, we'll see later um, on the on these delayed branches. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, another technique is adopted in this uh, is branch prediction, where both the instructions are, are executed in the condition is satisfied in one address and the condition is satisfied. Uh, you will execute the other address, right? So both the address are fetched. So that type of technique is also used in pipelining. But here in Spark, this technique is adopted. OK, so the Ultra Spark architecture also includes special purpose instructions to provide support for operating systems and optimizing compilers. OK, for example, high bandwidth block load and store operations can be used to speed common operating system functions. Communication in multiprocessor system is facilitated by special atomic instructions that can execute without allowing memory access to intervene. These are like semaphores, which are uh, for which we have to use these atomic instructions for the implementation. Okay, so uh, conditional move instructions may allow a compiler to eliminate many branch instructions in order to optimize program execution. Okay, so. Um, in the Spark architecture, okay, the so our input output is carried out in the Spark, Spark architecture. Uh, Spark architecture communication with I/O devices is accomplished with through memory. Okay, a range of memory location is logically replaced by device registers. Okay, each I/O device has a unique address. Okay, or set of addresses assigned to it. When a load or store instruction refers to the device register area of the memory, the corresponding device is activated. Sort of memory map to you, actually. The input output can be performed with the regular instruction set of the computer and no special I.O. instructions are needed. So this is the general overview of the risk architecture that I wanted to discuss in this context. OK, I do not go to the any specific um, architecture like PowerPC architecture, Cree and so and so forth they have discussed here okay so this uh, this is the i wanted just basic concepts of the risk architecture i have, I have described and then i'll move over to the topic of the design of assemblers which is given in your assignment you have to design a two pass assembler okay that is the simpler version okay so in this chapter we discuss the design and implementation of assemblers there are certain fundamental functions that any assembler must perform, such as translating mnemonic operation codes to their machine language equivalents and assigning machine addresses to symbolic labels used by the programmer. OK, so like uh, so, um, uh, so jump instruction and all uh, there are some you have to jump to certain label, right? So those things have to be taken care of. If we consider only fundamental functions, most assemblers are very much alike. Beyond this most basic level, however, the features and design of an assembler depend heavily upon the source language it translates and the machine language it produces. So its machine dependent features are also there. One aspect of this dependence is, of course, the existence of different machine instruction formats and codes to accomplish, for example, an add operation. As we shall see, there are also many subtler ways that assemblers depend upon machine architectures. OK, on the other hand, there are some features of an assembly language. OK, 
the corresponding uh, for the corresponding as in that have no direct relation with machine architecture okay so as i told in general or most of the system programs have a machine dependent feature and a machine independent feature okay so same applies to assembler also design of assembler also so they it has a machine dependent feature and machine independent feature so so they are um, so this machine uh, de independent feature are in a sense arbitrary decisions made by the decision designers of the language okay so we begin by considering the design of a basic assembler for the standard sic version that is the simplified instructional computer okay and th that we can of course extend to sic xc also okay so uh, this uh, uh, so uh, so first we introduce the most fundamental operations performed by a typical assembler and describe common ways of accomplishing these functions. The algorithms and data structures that we describe are shared by almost all assemblers. Okay. So thus, this level of presentation gives us a starting point from which to approach the study of more advanced assembler features. Okay. We can also use the basic structure of the framework from which to design the design of an assembler for a completely new unfamiliar machine. OK, so so we uh, so first we examine some typical extensions to the basic assembler structure that might be di dictated by the hardware considerations. We do this by discussing the assembler for the SICXC machine. OK, that is the extended version. OK. So also the SICXC assembler certainly does not include all possible hardware dependent features. It does contain some of the some of the ones that most commonly found in real machines. The principles and techniques should be easily applicable to other computers. So uh, so in, in the, uh, now we present a discussion of some of the most commonly encountered machine independent assembler language features and their implementation before discussing the machine dependent features. Once again, our purpose is not to cover all possible options, but rather to introduce concepts and techniques that can be used in, in new and unfamiliar situations. So here we examine some important alternative design schemes for an assembler. They, these are features of an assembler that are not reflected in the assembly language, okay, particular assembly language. For example, some assemblers process a source program in one pass instead of two. Other assemblers make more than two passes, okay? So we are concerned with the implementation of such assemblers and also with the environments in which each might be useful. OK. So when you would go for one pass assembler, when you would go for two pass assembler, when you would go for multi pass assembler, these are actually uh, so, sort of uh, uh, things we have to find out actually while designing. OK, so we uh, basically we would mostly concentrate concentrate on one uh, two pass and then one pass variety okay so and finally we briefly consider some examples of actual assembly language assemblers on real machines we do not attempt to discuss all aspects of these assemblers in detail instead we focus on the most interesting features that are introduced by hardware or software design decisions okay so basic assembler functions okay so, uh, so we uh, this uh, shows in the following table tabular form. We have shown the assembly language program for a basic uh, earlier means of of simplified instructional computer that is SIC. We use variations of this program throughout the chapter to show different assembler features. The line numbers for reference only, and not for and are not part of the program. The numbers also help to relate corresponding parts of different versions of the program. The mnemonic instructions used are those introduced, already we introduced, a indexed addressing indicated by adding the modifier X following the operand, okay? So let us take a look at the program first. This is the program. 
So this copy is the statement level and then we have the start directive. OK, and here the address is specified. OK. Then again, a statement level that is first. STL that is store linkage register return address in which this from where this procedure is called will return. OK. There are uh, there are uh, two uh, functions in, in this in this assembly language program. One is RD read record, and another is W rec, that is the write record. OK. So first we will jump to the subroutine RD rec. OK. What this RD rec is doing, it will read one record. OK. And uh, and it, this read operation is performed in a loop. OK. So and uh, so uh, and and it will uh, after reading it will write onto the output device. OK, it will read the record from the input device and write into the output device unless it will um, uh, reads a zero length record. OK, once it reads that zero le length record. OK, so it will uh, it will um, it will insert the end of file marker, OK? And it will it will terminate, OK? So this is what this program is doing. So load accumulator length. Length is returned by the RD rec, um, the length of the record. There is a maximum length, OK? And beyond, uh, if it is less than that, this length is important. So compare it equal to 0, OK? If it is equal to 0, OK? JEQ end fill, it will jump to this and it will insert load accumulator end of file. OK, otherwise. OK, it will write the corresponding record and jump to C loop and will repeat the operation. So this is looping till it reads the record of length zero and inserts end of file. OK, so and this uh, in this uh, from the, when it is inserting end of file, it will it will um, it will store accumulator buffer. OK, buffer is defined here. OK, so uh, it is uh, if it is normal exit. OK, so uh, 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 it is. Um, uh, so then this buffer content, OK, the buffer content will be. Uh, buffer content will be 4096. OK, otherwise uh, this end of file marker would be there and this uh, load accumulator uh, three okay this sets uh, the length to three okay and then it is invoking then it is store accumulator length okay so uh, it is uh, it will store that value of um, uh, uh, content of the accumulator to length okay and then it will uh, jump to the subroutine wr rec to write the end of file, OK? And then it will load the linkage register with the return address and return to the call program. So this is what this subroutine is doing, OK? Which is in turn invoking two subroutines, RDREC and WRREC, OK? So RDREC is performing. What is RDREC is performing? Here, of course, there is this is the data part of the program, defining end of file, the constant 3, constant 0, and it is reserving address for the return address, which is one word long length, which OK, which is the length of the record and buffer, OK, which is um, uh, which is a which is which is a um, uh, memory, uh, which is a series of memory location reserved in bytes 4096 bytes long. OK, so now uh, RD rec is performing zero, storing zero in the index register. Okay. Accumulator is also initialized to zero. Okay. Then it will loop. This is the polling operation being done. TD input, test device for the input, and jump to R loop. Okay. The device is being polled. Okay. So device is again here is the input device that is F1. Okay. So this is being polled through via busy waiting once the device is read the condition code is set okay if it is less than it will come out of the loop it will read the input device compare it with zero okay test for end of record okay if it is um, equal to it will it will jump 
to exit okay otherwise it will store character in the buffer uh, store character uh, uh, to the buffer indexed by the index register x okay and 4096 is the maximum record length so tix okay so it will uh, 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 it will compare uh, this content okay with the max length which is that is um, uh, that you uh, that is 4096 you can see this is defined in the data area okay so if it is less than it will repeat reading uh, continue reading otherwise if it is greater than 4096 okay it will come out of the loop okay and it will store uh, uh, in, uh, it will store length in, in case of exit it will store a different length in case of normal exit okay so uh, it will store uh, store this uh, store this uh, store this length that is um, uh, so this uh, length is uh, yeah this is uh, um, so uh, so it will store the actual length of the record okay and then it will return to the called subroutine okay so this uh, this is um, so here it is this rdrec is being executed they need to return to this load accumulator instruction and execute this instruction until it will encounter another jsub which is performing wr rec okay here, of course, this uh, record length is not checked. OK, so um, this uh, this comparison is not done. This uh, uh, compare with zero and all actually. So this uh, in the W uh, operation. So it um, so W subroutine, you can see it stores index register with the content zero. Again, it is performing a busy waiting here. OK, so in the, doing a polling operation, looping on the condition code of the output device, which is 0, 05, okay? And once the device is ready, the condition code is less than, it will load character from buffer indexed by the index register X and transfer it to the output device with this WD output instruction. TIX length, okay? Loop means loop until all the, all these, uh, um, uh, characters um, of the record uh, recorder are transferred to the output device. So that um, uh, thing, uh, th this number of looping is controlled by length. That is the length of the record. So loop until all characters, okay? So if it is less than, then of course it will jump to this W loop and continue looping. Otherwise, it will come out of the loop and perform this return from subroutine instruction and it will return to the called program okay so here it will return to this jc loop similarly when this um, wrec is invoked j sub wrec it will return to this load linkage register return address so this program is written in the sic model okay and your for your assignment purpose you run this program first okay on the uh, as an input to the two pass assembler okay so this uh, uh, will uh, this will help you in uh, in uh, this is a simpler version. Of course, you have to modify your assembler a little for the second assignment. Okay, when you design a linking loader. Okay, so let us go back. There are certain things that are, that I have discussed in the context of this program. They are called what we call assembler directives. For this assembler directives, no machine code will be generated, but it will help the assembler. Okay, it will help the assembler in generating the um, the machine code. Okay, so machine code has a one-to-one -one correspondence with assembly language instructions. So, so in addition to the machine instructions, we have the following assembler directives. Okay, so start. Okay. Start is an assembler directives that specify name and starting address of the program. Okay, 
So it instructs the loader actually from when to where the program will be loaded. OK, and uh, of course. Uh, we have to take into consideration uh, program relocation. OK, so that's the thing we will discuss later. OK, so end indicate the end of the source program and optionally specify the first executable instruction of the program to the loader. OK, so uh, now uh, byte byte you have already seen declares a one byte constant so generate character or hexadecimal constant occupying as many bytes as needed to represent the constant okay so uh, word also declares the word uh, so generate one word integer constant okay reserve byte okay reserve byte is re needed to reserve the so this is another assembler directive reserve the indicated number of bytes for the data area. And similarly, reserve word RESW reserves the indicated number of words for the data area. Reserve byte indicates uh, the number of bytes. Reserved word indicates the number of words, number of words, OK? Which is actually each word is three byte in this SIC architecture, OK? So um, these are assembler directives no output code will be generated for these directives okay so as you will see so the program contains main routine that reads records from an input device so this example program which you had already described okay with device code f1 and copies them to an output device that is as device code 05 the main routine calls subroutine r direct to read a record into a buffer and a subroutine WR rec to write a record from the buffer to output device. OK, each subroutine must transfer the record one character at a time. OK, because the only IO instruction available are RD and WD. The buffer is necessary because the IO rates for the two devices such as disk and the slow printing terminal may be different. OK. So uh, we can modify actually to use channel programs at operating systems calls on SIC access system to accomplish the same functions. OK, the end of each record is marked with a null character hexadecimal 00. If a record is longer than the length of the buffer 4096, only the first 4096 are copied. OK, that's what I told. OK. Unless it is marked with this um, this end of record uh, uh, marker, okay, okay. So that is zero zero. First four zero nine six bytes will be read and it will stop. The loop will stop. For simplicity, the program does not deal with error recovery when a record containing four zero bytes byte six or more is read. Okay, the end of the file to be copied is indicated by a zero length record. Okay. So if it is a zero length record, it will insert the end of file marker. OK, and terminates by executing an R sub instruction, which is loading uh, before after um, just before the instruction, the linkage register is loaded with the return address. OK, OK, so we assume that the program was called by the operating system using a J sub instruction. Thus, R sub instruction will return the call to the operating system. OK specified by the linkage register okay so a simple sic assembler okay so uh, so so we will see uh, uh, the program that is uh, a simple sic assembler that generated object code for each statement the column headed location okay gives the machine address in hexadecimal for each part of the assembled program we have assumed that the program starts with address 1000. OK, in actual this is the this is the generated code in the next page. The code means on the right side of this statement. I mean, this binary, uh, this hexadecimal numbers indicate the machine code that will be generated by the assembler. OK, so it is overlapping in your means uh, in the in the in the study material, if you see which I have given. Actually, the, in this uh, ebook, it is not very clear actually because it is overlapping with the 
uh, assembly language program, but in the study material that I have given, the photocopy, there you will see it uh, more clearly. Okay, so so this the translation of the source program to object could requires us to accomplish the following functions. So for each instruction, the mnemonic op, op codes or operation codes. Um, it converts the mnemonic operation codes to their machine equivalents like STL is converted to 14 in line 10. You can see STL 14 is generated followed by uh, the content of the. Uh, so. So this uh, so STL is 14 now uh, convert symbolic operands to their equivalent machine addresses translate like return address. So here STL return address, see return address, okay, is stored in location 1033 in the data area. So 141033 is the code that is generated when you, when first statement would not generate any code because it is uh, like, um, and assume the directive. This one will generate this code 141033. Okay. So now uh, build machine instructions in proper format, convert the data constants specified in the source program to their internal machine representations. Example UOF to 454F46 four in line 80. Okay. So, so this is you can see this is the uh, this is how this UF constant um, byte constant is declared. Okay, so in a string constant actually. So this uh, now uh, uh, this uh, write the object program and the corresponding assembly listing. Okay. So uh, this assembly listing is required in case of error actually. If there is an error, okay, this assembly listing is important because you can find out at which point the error is taking place, the correspondence, okay? So all of these functions except the second one, okay, the second one converts symbolic operands to their equivalent machine addresses, okay? This C, if you see this, when you are when you are generating the assembly code for STL return address, you have not encountered this return address. This return address is defined in the data area, return address reserved word one. So this is what we call a forward reference. So this address we don't know at this time, at this point of time. So you have to resolve what we call forward reference. Okay, that is what is the purpose of making the assembler a two pass assembler to resolve the forward references. OK, so all the functions except number two can be easily accomplished by sequential processing of the source program one line at a time. The translation of addresses, however, presents a problem. Consider the statement 10,001st STL return address. OK, so the instruction contains a forward reference. That is a reference to a label return address that is defined later in the program. Okay, if we attempt to translate the program line by line, okay, we'll be unable to process the statement because we do not know the address that will be assigned to return address when actually the STL, trans STL return address translation is taking place. Okay. Because of this, most assembler make two passes of the source program. Okay, in the first pass, okay, most as, uh, so uh, does little more, more than scan of the source program for label definitions and assign addresses such as in the location column. And the second pass performs most of the actual translations previously described. Okay, so in addition to translating the instruction. The source program, the assembler must process statements called assembler directives, okay, or pseudo instructions. There are very few assembler directives now, but for when you design this linking loader, there will be few more assembler directives that you have to provide, okay. 
So these statements are not translated into machine instructions. As I told, no code will be generated. Machine code will be generated, although they have an effect on the object program. Instead, they provide instructions to the assembler itself. Example of assembler directives are statements like byte and word, which direct the assembler to generate constants as part of the object program, and reserved byte and reserved word, which instruct the assembler to reserve memory locations without generating the data values. Okay, the assembler directives in our examples are start, which specifies the starting memory address of the object program, and end, which marks the end of the program. Okay, so uh, uh, so this uh, you can see that um, byte word, reserve byte, reserve word, start end, all these are assembler directives. Okay. So, uh, byte word, reserve byte, reserve word, uh, 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 generate constants as part of object program. Okay. Reserve byte, reserve word, instruct the assembler to remove reserve locations, generate data values. Okay. And start end, of course, are needed for the loading purpose. Okay. So, finally, the assembler must write the generated object code onto some output device. The object program will later be loaded into the memory, okay, for execution, okay. So the the example object program format we use contains three types of records, okay. So this you should uh, uh, your output of the assembler would be these records, okay. So header record, text record, and end record. So the header record contains the program name, starting address, and length. Text record contains the translated machine code, instructions, and data of the program. Okay, together with the indication of the address where these instructions are to be loaded. Okay, the end record marks the end of the object program and specified the address of the program where the execution is to begin. This is taken from the operand of the program's end statement. Okay. If no operand is specified, the address of the first executable instruction is used. Okay. The formats we use for these records are follows. So the details of the formats are column numbers, etc., are arbitrary. However, the information contained in these records must be present in some form in the object program. So this uh, so header record. So header record in the column one, you have the character H which is specifying that it's a header record. Column 2 to 7, you have the program name. Column 8 to 13, the starting address of the object program in hexadecimal. Column 14 to 19, length of the object program in bytes in hexadecimal. Okay, so this um, you can see. So this this is the code that well, for the for the uh, assembly language program we discussed today. Okay, so this is the header record whose name is copy. Okay. Then you have the starting address, which is in hex one, one triple zero. OK, and this is the length of the. Program in hexadecimal in number of bytes. OK, then you have the text record. These text records are, uh, of course, you have to generate during translation process. The column one contains T. Column two to seven starting address of the object in this record. OK. Column eight to nine, length of the object code in this record in bytes. Okay, and ten to sixty-nine, object code represented in hexadecimal. Two columns per byte of object code. So let us take a look. Actually, so so see this. Uh, see this text record. Um, the the first text record contains uh, the let's see 2 to 7 starting address of the object code in this record. So it is starting from location 1000. So this first record contains 1 triple 0. Then you have 1 E. OK, 1 E is basically the. Uh, uh, so 8 to 9, column 8 to 9, that is the length of the record in bytes. OK, so 1 is how much in X? It is uh, 16 plus. Uh, 
15, right? So no, that is 31. Okay. So that is uh, so it's uh, so it's you have seen each uh, subsequent thing. You have two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So uh, so six uh, in each uh, C. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So in each record you have uh, uh, three bytes, two columns per byte, right? So uh, there are six columns, okay? So you have uh, you have like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. OK, so you have uh, three bytes. OK, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. OK, so. Uh, one e is 30 actually. F is 15, so one is 30. So yeah, right. So 13 to 2 is 60. OK, so you can see that there are each uh, these of these uh, fields separated by this control character is um, three bytes long and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten such fields. OK, so that's why ten multiplied by three. OK, because uh, Six bytes, uh, six columns means three bytes. So 10 multiplied by three, that is 30. 30 bytes is the length of this record that is specified as 1E. And these are the these are the object code that we have already seen for the STL 141033. Okay, and so on, instruction by instruction. Okay, so this is how uh, this is the how the text records are defined. And the end record, of course, is column one is E. Column two to seven is address of the first executable instruction in object program in hexadecimal. To avoid confusion, we have used the term column rather than byte to refer to the positions within the object program records. Okay, this is not meant to imply the use of any particular medium for the object program. So this shows the object program. This uh, the, this following. Uh, this part, this figure, this figure shows the object program corresponding to the assembly language that we discussed earlier, assembly language program. In this figure, the object program we display, the symbol, this control character symbol is used to separate fields visually. Of course, each symbols are not present in the actual object program. This is only for the visual representation, okay? Because you know that um, it is uh, six, three bytes long, okay? So each uh, um, instruction in SIC, okay. So so it will be each uh, so the um, object code will be um, stored in six uh, consecutive hex bits, okay. So uh, so this uh, so these are not present in actual object program. Note that. There is no object program corresponding to 1033 to 2038. This is the data area of the program. The storage is simply reserved by the loader for use by the program during execution. We now give the general description, okay, so uh, uh, of the functions of the two passes of a simple assembly. Okay, so the pass one, okay, in the pass one we define symbols. OK, so in the past one, uh, we assign addresses to all statements in the program. OK, that is uh, to resolve the forward references. OK, uh, and uh, save the values assigned to all labels for using pass two. OK, so labels, the addresses corresponding to labels are defined in pass one to resolve forward references. 
and they are actually replaced in the actually translated assembly language in, uh, as in the machine code, okay, in pass two. Perform some processing of assembler directives. This includes processing that affects the address statement, such as determining the length of data area defined by byte, reserved word, etc. And in pass two, okay, the assembler instructions could uh, we perform assembling of these instructions and generate the actual object program. Okay, perform the actual translation. So first um, task is to assemble instructions, translating operation codes and looking up addresses. Okay, generate data values defined by byte, word, etc. Okay, perform processing of assembler directives not done during pass one. Okay, write the object program. Okay and the corresponding assembly listing. This is important. Assembly listing is important in case of errors, actually. OK, so in the section, we discuss these functions in more details and describe the internal tables required by the assembler and give an overall description of the logic flow of each pass. OK. So we actually require our uh, this two pass assembler requires some data structures. Our simple assembler uses two major internal data structures the operation code table, op tab, and the symbol table. Okay, so op tab is used to look up mnemonic operation codes and translate them to their machine language equivalents, and symbol table is used to store values assigned to labels. We also need a location counter. This is a variable that is used to help in the assignment of addresses. OK, so location counter is initialized to the beginning of the address specified by the start statement. After each source statement is processed, the assembled instruction, the length of the assembled instruction or data area to be generated is added to the location counter. OK, thus whenever we reach a label, in the source program, the current value of the location counter gives the address of the associate address associated with the label. OK, so. The operation code table must contain at least the mnemonic operation. OK, code and machine language equivalent in more complex assemblers. This table also contains information about instruction format and length. During pass one, optab is used to look up the and validate operation codes. OK, if it's a valid op code, otherwise it will generate an error message in the source program. In pass two, it is used to translate the operation code to machine language. Actually, in your SIC assembler, both these processes could be done either in pass one or pass two. However, for a machine such as SIC XC that has instructions of different lengths, we must search optab in the first pass to find the instruction length for incrementing location counter. OK, so uh, likewise, we must have the information op tab in pass two to tell us which instruction format to use in assembling the instruction and any peculiarities of the object code instruction. We have chosen to retain the structure in the in the current discussion because it's typical for most of the assemblers. OK. So op tab is usually organized what we call in the form of a hash table. OK, so you know hashing. You can use open addressing OK or separate chaining. OK, separate chaining is used. Separate chaining is you can easily use. OK. So um, um, optab is used hash table with mnemonic operation code as the key. OK, the information optab, of course, predefined when the assembler itself is written rather than being loaded into the table at execution time. OK, because because op code is you know in advance symbol uh, the symbol labels uh, address of these labels that you don't know because that is dependent that is program dependent but this op tab you can uh, create in advance and the hash table organization is particularly appropriate since it provides fast retrieval with minimum searching in most cases op tab is a static table okay that is entries are not normally added or deleted from it okay 
In such cases, it is possible to define, design a special hashing function or other data structure to give optimum performance for the particular set of keys being stored. Okay, most of the time, however, a general purpose hashing method is used. Further information about the design and construction of hash tables may be found in any good data structure text like Lewis Dinenberg and or Kunut. Okay, the symbol table includes the name and value address for the each label in the source program. Okay, the symbol table you don't know means uh, the symbols you don't know in advance. Optime you can optimize easily, but uh, symbol table you have is very much program dependent. So content of the symbol table. So name and value address of each label in the source program together with the flags to indicate error conditions. Okay, so at the end of so you have collected all the symbols uh, addresses of all the symbols in pass one. But while resolving this forward references in past past two, you find that some of the labels are not defined means what you have defined what you have gathered in past one. Then it's definitely an error actually. So together with the flags to indicate error conditions, example symbol defined in two different places. That is also another another possibility. OK, so in case of um, duplicate symbol names, that is another type of an error. So the table may also contain other information about data area or instruction labeled. For example, OK, its type of length. During pass one of the assembler, labels are entered into the symbol table as they are encountered in the source program along with their assigned addresses from location counter. During pass two, symbols used as operands are looked up in the symbol table, OK? to obtain the addresses to be inserted in the assembled instruction. Symbol table is usually organized as a hash table, okay, for efficiency of insertion and retrieval, okay. Since entries are rarely deleted from this table, efficiency of deletion is, an, is not an important operation because symbol table is used heavily throughout the assembly. Care should be taken in the selection of hashing functions. Programmers often select many labels that have similar characteristics. For example, labels that start or end with the same characters like loop 1, loop 2, loop A, or of the same length like A, X, Y, Z. It is important that the hashing function used to perform well with such non-random keys. Okay, so these are not truly random. So you can make it a little bit special for these non-random keys. Division of the entire key by a prime table length often gives a good result. OK, so this is you can use this as the bucket address and e in each bucket uh, you'd uh, store the store the chain. OK, or uh, chain of references. OK, so so this uh, it is possible for both passes of the assembler um, to read the original source program as output as input OK, so um, however the certain information such as location counter values and error flags for statements that can be that can or should be communicated between the two passes OK. For this reason, pass one usually writes an intermediate file that contains each source statement together with its assigned address, error indicators, etc. That is what we are calling as assembly listing. OK, the file is used as input to pass to. OK, the working copy of the source program. OK, can also be used to retain the results of certain operations that must, must be maybe performed in pass one. OK, such as scanning the oper operand field for symbols and addressing flags. So these need not be performed again during pass two. Similarly, pointers into op tab and sim tab may be retained for each operation code and symbol table used. This avoids okay need to repeat many table searching operations. Okay. So this program actually, what you have to implement is this program. Okay. So this program you have to implement in your assignment. 
So this program is given in these two figures, 2.4a and 2.4b. Okay. So this uh, 2.4 and 2.4b show the logic flow of the two passes of our assembler. Although described for the simple assembler, we're discussing this is also the underlying logic for more complex two pass assemblers that we'll consider later. Okay. We assume simplicity that the source lines are written in a fixed format with fields label, opcode, operant. Okay. If one of those fields contains a character string that represents a number, we denote the numeric value with the prefix hash. Okay. So at this stage, it is very important for you to understand thoroughly the algorithms that is described in this figure. OK, this is described in this in this uh, part itself means basic data structure that you will use and that is the pseudocode that you have to actually write in C. OK, and you have to generate those type of records, header record, text record and end record. OK, for when you will be implementing this assignment too, you have to little bit modify this assembler to generate what we call modification records. OK. So. Uh, uh, so this. Uh, uh, so so much of the detailed passenger logic of course has been left out to emphasize the overall structure and main concepts. You should uh, think about details for yourself and you should also attempt to identify those functions of the assembler that should be implemented as separate procedures or modules. For examples, operations like search symbol table, read input line might be good candidates for such implementation. The kind of thoughtful analysis should be done before you make any attempt to actually implement an assembler or any other large piece of software. OK, so uh, we'll, uh, this is actually uh, also discussed in software engineering classes. Also software engineering tools describe this uh, these things OK, so uh, actually uh, this I will discuss uh, you go through this uh, pseudo code OK, so which is described here OK, so I will I'll start discussing on this pseudo code and also uh, the machine dependent assembler features in the next tutorial OK, that is tomorrow's tutorial OK, so if you have any question you can ask me OK. Excuse me, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yes. Sir, I wanted to ask you. Uh, first of all, the object code shown in the book. There, there are multiple text records, right? There are almost um, five to six text records. But where are these text records actually uh, broken? Like when? When do I actually switch from first text record to second text record? In the okay, book, that is uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That is uh, uh, like uh, you can store like uh, uh, C. Mm. Uh, see this. Uh, see, this is um, uh, so 10 to 69. This is the definition. OK, so that is the maximum length. After that, you have to create a new text record. Okay. Why 69, sir? Exactly. No, they, they, this is this is this is how they, in this uh, SIC machine it is uh, specified like that. OK. OK, so and, and can you just uh, show that um, object code on the screen for a second? Please? Object code uh, um, I move to the next slide. Yes. Sir. Yeah. No, this is before I think. Yeah. Oh no, so object code, sir. the, uh, the um, assembled object code. Where yeah. the record is present, head record. Oh, text record. OK, 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 OK. Yeah, right. This one. Yes, sir. So yeah, uh, in this, uh, the second text record is not actually the, the 69 length. The, only the first record is of length 69. So why is the second Six, record uh, ended? Uh, like see, I told it is a 30. Um, this um, the, uh, so there are there are 60 columns here. You cannot uh, and uh, I think um, you can uh, you can uh, so 60 columns are uh, already occupied. Right, 30, 30 multiplied by 260. OK, yes, so and each uh, I think you can, could have inserted one more. Yeah, means perhaps you could have inserted one more instruction. Means uh, because 60, uh, there are uh, 10 to 69. No, sorry, 
10 to 69, that is 59. So yeah, 10 to 69. So 59, 59, um, 60 columns are at most you can store. So that is what is after that the new text record is created. So yeah, one, just, one is 30, 30 multiplied by 260. So 60 yes. columns are stored here. Okay. After that, a new text record is created. Okay. Okay. It is because the second text record is very small. It, it could have been extended. Yeah, it okay. could have been right, 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 right. But that it ended right. ended before because um, uh, this. Um, I think there is a some data area of the program is there after that actually. Oh, okay. okay. So this sir, is not consecutive store addresses addresses actually. Yeah. Okay. So one more thing, could you show the uh, pseudo code of the two pass assembler of the book? I had a small doubt in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in this, um, okay, this is, yeah, so in this, sir, uh, the, the, could you see the loop? If uh, else if opcode is equal to word, then do this. Else if yeah. opcode is equal to res word. So uh, word is fine, res word is fine, uh, even res byte is fine. But in the last section where it is written, if opcode is equal to byte, then uh, this thing, begin length of constant in bytes, add length to... Uh, uh, this this is because a word is only one word constant, but string can be of any length. Okay, so byte does not mean one byte constant. Okay. Okay. So byte is not just a uh, one byte constant. It can no, be larger. No, no, byte constant. No, no. Character string can be declared. Okay. Sir, uh, another thing is um, this byte is uh, written as constants all over the book, right? The word and byte. Uh, declare the variables declared using word and byte keywords, right? So yeah. are these actually constants in the sense that they cannot be changed by the uh, we cannot change them, or are they just constants? No, no, they are constants. They are constants. You can change any memory locations that are that you have reserved using reserved word and reserved byte. Okay, those locations okay. you can change. So can we just resolve them in uh, like when we do the first pass of the assembler? We just take these constants and hard code them. Is it possible? You can do that, but uh, but you you means according to yeah th those locations are uh, means uh, treated as constant. So you should not means according to this specification of SIC, this word and uh, word and byte, those locations are defined as constant. So you should not change those locations. Rest of the locations you can change, which are defined by reserved word and reserved byte because they are okay. the data area of the program. So from your program, you can perform read and write from there. Okay. And sir, can you just uh, go up to the uh, section where this uh, source code is written? Uh, source code of the input output program, the buffer input output program. Here? This page? No, no. No, no, the source, source code, sir. Not the assembler. Oh, Watch the source, source code. code. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. This program? Yes, so it's code with the object code written next to it. That one. Oh, but that part is over. Yeah, that is uh, that is not very clear in this ebook, as I told. Okay. Okay. So, I I just had a uh, so, small doubt in this, sir. In this, there was a um, uh, the instruction of uh, input device f1, right? We declare yeah. input byte and then we write x uh, hexadecimal f1. Okay, so that is a directive, right? Uh, assembler directive. So logic that should not be converted into any. No, that is not converted. No, no. Yeah. But in the object code, it is written. The F1 part is written. I I could not understand that, sir. The, in the object code, F1 is written corresponding to that. So why is it written? Well, this uh, online. Uh, just a second, sir. I had the book. Um, sir, line 185 of the input where it is written input byte x dash f1 dash. Yeah, for um, 
yeah, for this um, constants, it is it is generating, uh, it is storing that that thing, actually, that number. It, it, it stores the instruction. What does this instruction F1 mean? F1 is not an instruction. It's the device number. In but device it number. In Why is it stored in the memory? Instruction next to instruction is it stored. So that is stored for this test device uh, thing means TD. It is to, it will pull that device. OK. So you have to know the uh, which input device it is that will be known from the from that number, right? Okay. So we just stored all the data and instructions together. Is it like that? Like this device is stored. There is instruction there. Then this, so like there are instructions and then there is this device data. And then there is other data and then another instruction comes. So I'll just store together the instructions and data together in the same um, piece of um, memory. This uh, in the uh, see in the. Um, I think. Uh, in the generated. Uh, this uh, in the generated part sir, or the generated object. Small F1 is written. F1 is written? Yes, sir. In the second last record. Okay. So this uh, yeah, this is this is written, right? See in the yes, fourth uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth line. Okay. <laughs> this uh, uh, see this is this zero five is written. For the output device number, okay. So, so this is this is generated as a part of the record, right? Just after the, yeah. Okay, so all the data is stored next to instructions. I mean, data and instructions are treated like just the same in memory. Is no, it? Uh, the, the constants only for the reserved okay. word and reserved reserved byte. You don't have to generate anything actually. Okay, so reserve word and reserve byte are not here, uh, so they are in some other part of the dam, is it? That um, no, that is uh, no, no. That is con that will be consecutive. Uh, that will be that uh, while while storing in the memory. Okay, that will be uh, the uh, memory location will be allocated uh, in consecutive fashion. Okay? okay, it will not be in another part of the memory. Okay, but so um, all instructions and all all this data is stored together in consecutive manner, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, no, assembler would not generate any record for the for those reserved word and reserved byte. Okay, and uh, in the end, how do I test my object code? So if I generate my object code, how do I test it if it is actually correct or not? If my assembler is working or not? Where do I execute this code? Object code that I generated. That too, uh, you have to have the actual microprocessor because it is a hypothetical language. So, uh, so uh, we don't have any actual uh, microprocessor. Actually, um, this assembly language are meant for some certain microprocessor. So you have to hard code this uh, thing into some microprocessor. Okay. There okay are, uh, so this is this is. You have to have some simulator for this SIC, but it is it is. Uh, we, that uh, that is we are not uh, expecting. We are just uh, we are we have to do the correct translation actually. Okay, okay. sir. How will how will debugging uh, be done then? I mean, it is very difficult to debug your code when you cannot test the output. No, I told you just uh, uh, take this program and see whether your assembler is generating the corresponding text record that is generated specified in this way. Okay. Yes. So in that way. Evaluation of the assignment also only this. You have to go through manually actually. You have to go through manually through these text records and okay. see whether the audio. The program be evaluated, sir. The assignment that part thing will be evaluated. Pardon? The assignment we submit on 25th, that is due on 25th. How will that be evaluated? On what input will that be evaluated? That I told you in the assignment itself on this sample program, the, the one I had showed today. And the corresponding record text record you have to generate. Okay. 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 So marks will also be given based on only that, no other program, right? Um, uh, uh, no, the uh, of course uh, correctness of the uh, program is also important. Means you just can't do a, some uh, uh, translation and generate this code like that. Means yeah, you, 
thank you so if you don't have any other question i'm concluding today's meeting okay so thank you for listening bye now